Hello. Stop video. There we go. Yes, perfect. Nice to see you. Yes. Hi, Summer Rain. How are you doing? It's very nice to see you. I just had a wonderful experience going to the Liberty Hyde Bailey Horatorium, the herbarium at Cornell University. Oh, yeah. And they have the largest collection or at least one of the largest collections. I don't want to misspeak, but I think it's the largest collection of plant catalogs from like the 1800s all through current day. And they brought out some of your old plant catalogs from oh, really? yeah, from like the 1950s. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a while ago. <laughs> I don't know if you have like the whole collection of Logie's catalogs. I, we have quite a few of them going back probably into the 40s. I don't know if we have the original uh, sheet of paper that was created. Yeah. It was just a sheet that they sent out in like in the 1930s, but we do have them going back to the 40s. Yeah, yeah, that's, it was very neat to yeah. see because they had um the you know they were mostly like obviously black and white, and then they had one from like 1997. It was like a skinny little pamphlet with like some color yeah. photos, and yeah, it was really neat to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time out today, and um and I know I can't be there in Connecticut with you, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you have many new and maybe old, but new for few folks, uh, plants that they would love to see. So I was just hoping that you could actually show us some of your selection that you're excited about. Yeah, well, um, we have a lot going on as always. And, um, you know, our, our, um, the most entertaining part of our work here is new plants, um, but with my work going back, um, you know, many decades, a lot of those old plants um, we're bringing back. And um, it's pretty exciting to see people get interested in things that I've cultured all for these many years and have fallen off. And now all of a sudden they're coming back into popularity. And the whole house plant interest that happened, which, you know, we've witnessed in the last five or six years, um, has reinvigorated a lot of that material. So um, I don't know where to start, but I can, one of the things we had was the <clears throat> cameras not picking up a lot of the colors we were just trying uh, before uh, we connected with you. And so um, unfortunately we're going to get, I think, we're, I don't know how it's going to appear, but um, mm -hmm. we're going to probably get some darker colors than what they really are. But here's one of um, the first ones that we wanted to show you. This is a begonia hybrid that we are releasing um come christmas so you can see it out here it's got beautiful form to it it's a it's a rhizomatous and it has very short petioles the plant itself will probably never get much taller than this and that's actually a mature leaf on it and if you look at the leaves i don't know if i can get better light oh, i mean on this, they're like a really red, beautiful red merlot color yeah Yes, there's red veining that follows. This is the interesting part about this hybrid. It's very deep red veining that follows um, the leaf veins, along with um, this kind of bronze color. There's actually some green in it. And what I'm seeing right now is just kind of very dark, but um, it actually has quite a bit of color to the leaf. I definitely see the green. And I see as, some purples. I see, I see the bronzes. I see the deep reds. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks stunning. Yeah, and... Um, like all rhizomatous, not all of them, but many rhizomatous, they changes with the season. So um, summertime, for whatever reasons, probably the intensity of light, they get very dark. That would This would be the worst, if you want to call dark worse, the worst of the dark. And then as wintertime comes, they lighten up, which is interesting because it's the exact opposite of what happens to our sunlight. Um, but anyway, and it has pink flowers. If you subject rhizomatous to a shortening day length, and they're not terribly sensitive as some plants, like a poinsettia, they're not as sensitive as a poinsettia. Um, they actually put out these tall sprays of pink flowers. So that's one that we've um, just developed and it's going forward. That's very nice. I mean, it has this really nice clump forming habit. It yes. looks very, beautiful form. yeah, beautiful form. Nice roughly along the edge, but not overly roughly. You know what I mean? And yeah. And it looks like it has a nice thick, firm leaf. And maybe it is because of the short petiole. It's not like flopping all over the place, you know? Yeah, the leaf 
Well, I don't know if the police any firmer, but it's very tight. So it's not something that has long. Many of the old hybrids of rhizomatous had really long petioles. Um, uh, Mama Duke is one of them that's become has been very popular over the years. That has a pretty long petiole. It doesn't form a nice round plant. And our breeding here has been to compact those down. I mean, that's just a thing I like about them. So, so that anyway, was that's... a new one and not like an old hybrid that you're bringing back. Right. Right. That's a new one um, that we worked on. Then um, we grow a lot of the um, uh, fancy hibiscus. And for the for this talk today, we just went out and grabbed some stuff that was in flower. But um, as you can see, if I set it back, that's the size plant it takes to bring it into bloom. So really for an indoor growing, this is very fit for the windowsill. And um, these plants, they have to have sunlight. It's not something you can grow in the shade. So you need a sunny window, but you could literally within a foot taller than this, you could keep this plant at this size forever, except periodically you'd have to chop it down. And so the, the key is not to chop it down like at the wrong time of year and the wrong times when you don't have any light. So right now, this plant's got a lot of buds on it. Um, and I would allow that to completely go into its flowering cycle and then leave it because we know, I don't care how we resist it. We know winter's coming. The days are going to shorten and everything's going to stop. And every year I can't believe it's going to happen. And it does. So you're going to get that point where um, the plant is going to completely stop growing as it does in the winter time. And then you wait for that February length of day length and it comes back. And then that's the time to do the, the pruning on it. So, so um, right, like right before spring occurs. Right. Yeah. Okay. In, the, in, the, in our Northeast here, at least in our latitude, um, it's usually by the time we hit um, the end, first of February, I think the light is strong enough to grow plants. Like December and January, it's not strong enough to grow plants. And then it gets strong enough. And then, you, of course, it's a delayed reaction light is. So it takes a number of weeks before you start seeing the response from that. And that would happen um, probably by the 1st of March. Everything is really going strong. And for that one, if somebody is growing it, let's say, in California climate or Florida climate, uh, well, they might not have to have to grow it indoors. But are they chopping it back to keep it small? And if so, when? No. Well, the, it, it, in South Florida, where they grow these outside, where there's no frost, they will, they can do it any time of year. You can go to um, Selby Gardens. They had a, they have a very nice collection of these, so you can view them. And they have been, you can go down there in December and they're still in bloom because they have strong enough light for that. And what variety of hibiscus is this? This is a variety called um, Fiesta de Sol. Um, and um, there's tons of hybrids, um, and you can pick from all kinds of colors. We have one called the Path, and the Path has been probably one of our better sellers for the last 50 years. And I have no, and then people have tried to recreate that, and they did, and it didn't sell as well. I don't know whether the name the Path makes the Path keep going, or maybe the Path never ends. So um, <laughs> the plant that um, we've had, and that actually gives us almost 12 months of blooming in the greenhouse. Some, some hibiscus have better, uh, longer flowering periods than others. And most of the breeders that work on this don't think about us in the north, you know, so they don't let necessarily select for that. It's something that comes into the greenhouse and then we watch it go forward, yeah. Well, that looks incredible. It looks like almost like a, a dripped wax you know, the kind of wax that people would use in, for their envelopes, like right in the center of that flower. Yeah. Yes. It does look like wax. Yeah. It really does. yeah. <laughs> and there's so many colors you can choose from. So anybody that has sunny windows and loves beautiful flowers, you know, you should try some of the fancy hibiscus. There are other varieties that, ha that are also very good, but they often um, are smaller flowered and they tend to be a little more leggy. So these plants really, I don't know, the breeding on that um, has really shortened them down. They just have very tight internodes, basically. Mm. Yeah. And then um, we have some jasmines. This is one of our older, I mean, it doesn't look like too much, but it's got a really great fragrance. If you smell that, it's just so sweet. And um, this is Grand Duke, which is a very tall growing sandback. So the sandbacks... Um, all of them are very free blooming. 
Um, this is probably the least of them in that it does shut down in the winter time. But they all have that very similar fragrance to them. And the two that um, are probably most widely grown in the world are Sandback, uh, Made of Orleans, and Grand Duke. And this one has popularity throughout Asia, going even into going up into China. Um, whereas Made of Orleans is probably pretty widespread between, now that's a single flower of this, pretty much spread between uh, from India all the way to the Philippines up into the, um, uh, up into uh, Southeast Asia. And um, the flower on this is double. I think that's one of the things that, that they like. Well, actually, it looks like a carnation if you look at it. Yeah, I actually think it also looks like some of the icing that they would put on the cakes, you know, when you have your birthday cakes and they just kind of make that little icing flowers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the interesting thing about all of the sandbacks is they can be used for um, infusing water. So if you pick the flower off and you put it into a glass of water or a jar of water overnight, when you get up in the morning, you'll actually be drinking jasmine. So and, it's a jasmine tea, essentially. Right. A jasmine tea. Yeah. Exactly. You could use it for tea also. There's several jasmines that are used for tea, but sandback is um, one. And also... Um, they have some religious significance to them, to the Buddhists. And um, in the Philippines, it's, uh, the single one is the national flower of the Philippines, Sampagita. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in that. And they're quite easy to grow. It's not too hard. The Grand Duke actually is, has several forms of its strains that we've had over the years. This is actually the most vigorous of them. Some of them are kind of yeah, they're stubby little growers and they don't like to grow unless it's really hot and things like this. But this particular clone of it um, grows very fast. You can see it stretches up a little bit, but it grows very fast and has a long flowering period. And how would you recommend growing something like that in the house? Would you like try to trellis it? Would you let it kind of like grow all over the place? What would you recommend? Uh, I would. It's a very upright grower. So you're going to need to stake it. And I would um if you don't do anything it's not a vine though in the sense that it's going to climb it's a vine sort of like Pisithia, where it's just going to shoot up this big shoot and then get too heavy and it's going to fall over so periodically you want to cut them back and typically on all of the sandbacks um you want to really be pruning them periodically now don't do that again it's just like the hibiscus don't do it in the winter time but in the summertime you want to cut them back so they can reflush once this flowering cycle is over so you can keep it contained this will go up to three four feet in the greenhouses and pots if we don't do anything with it yeah anyway it's a great plant and it really smells good um next we have um i don't know if you can move that over oh yeah we can see it it's very yeah, so this is the Australian, this is our Australian um, blood lime. There's several names for it. We've had it in the greenhouse for at least a decade. And this plant is at least that old, 10 years old. It's a plant we have to graft. We put it onto a understock that has fairly good resistance to disease. And it has got to be the most prolific producing citrus that we grow. And we grow a lot of citrus here at Logis. And does it taste just like a lime or does it have some it's, other type of nuance to the flavor? Um, it's a finger lime. So this is a hybrid between um, citrus, citrus australis, australisica or microcitrus, sanguinea, which is red, and the rangpoor lime. And, um, and, that, and that's not like, really known but that's what they think it is and it appeared obviously in australia where they grow it and actually you're growing it commercially the interesting thing about it is well there's several things really interesting it has really fragrant flowers and if you take a citrus flower and you smell it it smells like a citrus flower like you know a navel or tangerine or even a uh, lemon this is entirely different it smells perfume like really, really intense perfume. Like a like a rosy kind of perfume or yeah. still like a very perfumey citrus, you know? No, no citrus at all. No citrus smell no at all. Okay. All. But not like a rose. I would guess it's kind of go like Lang Lang or something like that. Words. Interesting. And it's got little pink flowers and they flowers in the springtime along with the rest of the citrus. Many of the finger limes will flower a long, have a long flowering cycle. We have them in bloom right now in the greenhouses, but this one has its season that it does it. And then it puts out this, this mass of fruit. You can, I don't know if that's- It's camera. crazy. I could see it. It's so fruitful. There's hundreds of them on this. No. Right here we have, 
right here we have some that are starting to um i think one just red. fell off <laughs> and they're, they'll actually turn they actually turn to a, a kind of a burgundy burgundy or or maroon color to them and it varies quite a bit from season to season i'm not sure why some years we get great color other years they stay um just kind of a um they get a little uh, yellow in them rather than the color and it weeps so the this foliage isn't a is beautiful yeah the foliage is beautiful is it weeping because it's so heavy and laden with no, it just no. it's a weepy plant yeah, yeah. happy it's weeping, weeping mulberry in a way like just kind yeah. of whoop. yeah yeah and it goes down and if i think if you google it uh, and you go online they have some commercial orchards that they were producing these in and you can see all the trees are just like you know flowing down to the ground so it's a great plant. And um, the couple things about the um, Australian limes is they don't get the greenings. They're resistant to it. So this is a plant that really has very little disease issues. Not that we have that problem here in Connecticut because we, right. we're not where we have the psyllid that spreads it. And we're really careful with our stock that we don't bring anything in that would cause problems like that but they're very resistant and as i mentioned we grow that here at logies as a graft and we put it on a root stock that is pretty indestructible mm -hmm. where many citrus stocks have disease problems um this one is pr pretty much foolproof and being an australian lime they're very tolerant to drought many citrus are anyway they're, so they're very tolerant to drought but anyway it's a great plant to have and i say like if you look at 10 years of growth on that and that's what you get, um, it's pretty, it's a pretty impressive plant. Yeah. Just a question out of like grafting the citrus. I've never seen this happen in citrus, but my um, knowledge of it is limited. But you know how like a lot of times in the older grafts of crab apples, you would get a lot of root sprouts suckering. coming up, suckering. Okay. Yeah. Do you have that at all with citrus? Um, we do have, when you initially do the graft, on citrus plants, you don't get root suckers, but you do get um, suckers coming off of the understock stem. And we do have a period when you got to rub them off and bump them off. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we send a, a plant to a customer and lo and behold, it does that suckering and you don't know it. And all of a sudden that's, that sucker will take over. Yeah. And so if you see, if you ever get grafted citrus, you always want to look at your leaf. And then if you see something coming out of the base, look at the leaf. And if they're different, get rid of it. Yeah. Because whatever reason, the understock always dominates the cyan or the, um, the upper part of the plant. Yeah. Um, and then um, one of the plants that we've been um, growing for a while, uh, and Palaenopsis are nothing unusual, but this is a beautiful um, the apricot. Yeah. Yeah, it's called carrot cake, which is a wonderful name for it. Wonderful, wonderful name. Bravo on that. <laughs> yeah, no, it has a it has a, a veining in the um, in the flower petals and a red lip to it. So, um, and phalaenopsis, we all know that they're great plants. I have one in my house that I got from a friend who has passed away. She was very ill and gave me the plant, and I've had it's been twenty years now that she's been gone, and I still have it in the window in her remembrance um, and it grows fine. I get flowers out of it every year. So these are the, these are really indestructible orchids. I mean, you gotta really work hard to, to kill them. And um, in our culture here, we grow them, or at least personally, I grow mine in sphagnum moss. I don't know, there's a lot of medias for growing them, but I grow them in a clay pot um, with sphagnum and bring the media to just about dryness and then thoroughly saturate it. And if you, you do that. And, you know, like so many orchids, overwatering is what kills them, right? On so many orchids. So this is a plant that you can grow in your east or west window and flower regularly. And you can go away for two weeks, three week vacation and don't have to worry about it when you yeah. come back. So it's a beautiful um, yellow, yellow fail that um, um, is in bloom right now. I've and had then, my most floriferous uh, phalaenopsis actually in... I, we have these huge picture windows now in upstate and it's, it's Southern facing, but the fact that it gets cold in winter, it seemed to have really liked that. Like it liked to be up against the window. And then the next spring, it was just, I, I think it must've had 30 or 40 blooms on it. I'd never seen anything so 
floriferous as far as the phalaenopsis goes. And I was like, well, liked it there. <laughs> and then, and then Sonder accidentally broke the pot. <laughs> what? And we, had to, we had to move it because the, the windowsills are, are very small. Oh. And so, you know, you walk by and you like knock the knock pot. It over. Over. Well, I got yeah. time to repot it. Yeah. Time to repot. He, yeah, he has to glue the pot. It was like a perfect little pot for it, but. <laughs> well, you know, phalaenopsis actually respond to a drop in temperature. That's what that's makes what it seems. Power. Yeah, and, that's what it seems. And probably the increased light that it's getting in that window helped it some, hmm. plus some loving care that you're giving it. So, yeah. you know, all those things come together and suddenly you get really, you get a lot of glory. Yeah. Uh, and then we have, um, this is a Calathea, Marantasi family. Um, this is called White Fusion. We've had this around for a number of years. Um, it has a beautiful variegation to it and has this kind of pink understem to it. The interesting thing about white fusion is it doesn't get a lot of that tip burn that mm. Calatheus get. We struggle with that quite a bit. And um, this one's pretty much free of it. So uh, for low light areas where you're looking for some interesting color in terms of irrigation and things like that, that's a great plant. We've had it for a number of years now. So it's kind Have of- Have you ever had it flower? No. Yeah. Wow. So, and that can be um, our culture or it could be the variegation. Because remember, this is probably a sport. I doubt if it's a hybrid. So this mm -hmm. is a sport. So somewhere along the way, this green Calathea like this doesn't decide to go variegated. And doing that, it could reduce the amount of energy going into blooming. Into blooming. But it could also be our culture. Yeah. That, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I was, I was very curious because... Um, many of the Calatheas have been moved over to Japortia, a new genus, and it's strictly, you know, based on flowers. So that's why I was wondering if you actually ever had it flower, because the Calathea and the Japortia flowers look very different from one another. Ah, oh, no, I never did. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Very cool. And, and also, so, you know, saw how sometimes the Calathea slash Japortias, they put like a little flower, like the roof of Barba. I don't know if you've ever seen that little yellow flower that comes yeah. out from the base. Yeah. Whereas yeah. some like stick out a big flower spike. So yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Keep but, your um, eye out. Keep your eye yeah, out. Yeah, it has never bloomed. You never know. We may see it. Now that you've mentioned it, it may wake up. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, um, we have a vanilla plant and these have become very popular. People are very interested in it. The vanilla vine is actually, we know that is an orchid and they are a little bit challenging to grow. And usually what happens is, is that the root systems get damaged um, usually to overwatering and then the plant is lost. And it's also a strange plant in that it has sort of an epithetic terrestrial habit to it. So if you think about this growing somewhere in the jungles, it's got all these air roots on it that are right now coming out and they're actually getting moisture from the air as most orchids do but it also has its roots in the ground and so there's this it's a plant that's doing both being the epiphytic and terrestrial and it's a little sensitive in the root system um, mm -hmm. the other thing is is that they have to become fairly large vines i mean fairly large probably more than um several feet in height before they begin to bloom and um, we do flower them occasionally in the greenhouses but it's not something that's really reliable um, and then once you've got to the point where it blooms you've got to hand pollinate it so you need to get to that point where you start looking up how do I pollinate an orchid because we don't have the bug in here that's going to do that and if you do that you get this pod that comes out, which becomes the bean. And then if you get the bean, you have to go through a steaming and then a ripening of it, which I've done with our pods to get that. And, and it worked. It actually turned black and it smelled like vanilla. And I think I ground it up and put in alcohol and then ended up with vanilla flavoring that I made some cake with or something <laughs> this is a number of years ago me, but I, I had to go from the very from this year and go through the whole process to get it done it was a long one loji pod and then you 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 auctioned it off on ebay <laughs> yeah right <laughs> no you enjoyed it you enjoyed it in cake that's amazing 
Well, what what uh, substrate are you actually growing those roots in, considering that it is an orchid and that it does have some sensitive roots? Are you growing it in something like sphagnum or are you growing it in something different? Um, we grow we grow ours in sphagnum and we don't have a lot of problems with them, but people do. And mm -hmm. sphagnum is a is a really great substrate for growing many things, but it does hold a lot of water. And it's also about the type of sphagnum you're using. So I know with orchids, um, they really like that heavy fiber stuff. There's some of the um, South American or New Zealand um, sphagnums, and you can buy those. They, they do sell them, are probably better for this kind of work. Interesting. Um, yeah, and, and we grow a lot, a lot of things in sphagnum moss. Um, and the stuff we get is both that, you know, South American or New Zealand, but we also use the Wisconsin or local sphagnum. And sometimes when I'm out foraging for mushrooms, I get into the wooded areas where I find clumps of it and I usually fill my backpack with it so that I can bring it back to have that special. And I, there's many species of it. Um, we don't really know that because most of us are not sphagnum geeks, but there's many species of it. And some of them, even the local ones are very, very high quality. Yep. How important for some of the plants that you had shown us, especially, you know, maybe the hibiscus or the or uh, the vanilla orchid or anything along those lines, is it important to have like airflow in and around your plant? Or do, do you think that does not matter so much? Um, air movement is really important for all plants. And um, I don't know if that would make makes the difference totally into whether you're successful or not. But, you know, in our greenhouses, we have fans running all the time, which is kind of annoying because some of them are pretty noisy. But we always have some air movement. And I'm not the one that figured that out. That's going through scientific review and testing and so on. So if you can, even just the smallest amount of air circulating, because houses can get pretty stagnant. And you really don't want that. Well, thank you so much, Byron. I, I really nice. It was very nice seeing your face and also all your plants and flowers. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Glad well, to, glad to yeah. See you again. Yeah, yeah. Same here. So what's next on your uh, on your escapades up at Logies? Just out of curiosity. Oh, well, we rebuilt one of our greenhouses, our big, big greenhouse, which um, if people are in the area they should come and see it we oh cool or the thing down to the ground <gasps> we moved all the plants out and we rebuilt the whole, whole structure up and then we redesigned the entire interior it's it's really a great it's really great we got we got new glazing on the tops so the light levels very high and we um you know we created kind of a my brother came and looked at it who hasn't been here for a number of years and goes you've got a botanical garden because we put paths in it and yeah and we're having a lot of fun with it too it's it's getting to the point now it's we started it yet we repeat we put the plants in last fall and everything was young and trying to get going now we've had a summer's growth on it so i mean it's really quite quite amazing oh, well if we ever make it back up that way we would love to come and see it that sounds marvelous yeah. and a huge undertaking so good on you yeah it took us all summer to do it and ripping all the well we left some of the old mother plants in there anything that was in the ground couldn't move out we left them and they had to put up with all the goings on but um yeah it's it's quite nice yeah and we're still collecting plants i've um i've gotten into working with some of the ananasi fruit tropical mm. fruit, like cherimoya mm -hmm. anamoya sugar apples and things like that i kind of feel like fruits like you know, that subtropical tropical fruits is really one of your niches you know next to begonias and everything you really like those those fruits yeah so we're in greenhouses and um you know we can grow things like that um and we try things that can be grown in containers we wrote a book on it a number of years ago so we tried things that, and so the ananasi some of them actually work pretty well. Cherimoyers are, I don't know if anybody knows the fruit, but they're delicious. They're these big kind of, oh yeah, that big, and they have these kind of gnarly sides to them. You cut them open, there's big black seeds, and the fruit is really delicious. But um, they're usually too big. We've tried that. But the ad Adamoyer is a hybrid between that and a sugar apple. Now, a sugar apple is a little tiny plant. It'll flower two feet or less and mm. produce fruit. Um, for you so and this is working out pretty well that puts out a quite a we got probably 15 on a trial plant that we're working we've got we have 15 to 20 fruit on it and 
in Connecticut here, they ripen in February, which is a great time of year to be eating tropical food. Amazing, and amazing time. Question, yeah, and the question is whether you could grow that indoors. Um, and I think you, the answer is probably yes. Um, providing you have that large south window that your phalaenopsis was growing in. Right. Where you could give it, because it does have a dormancy. It's, I think it could actually be deciduous in some um, uh, types of environments where it stops growing completely, drops some of its leaves. So <clears throat> that's very good for those of us, you know, who don't have that light in the winter time. Right. And so would the deciduous out. nature be spurred by the waning sunlight or like a heat, like heat or? The dormancy? Yeah, the dormancy. No, I, think right? it's a, I think it's a light thing. Yeah. Okay. Shortening day length. Because the whole thing's going to stop here probably in another two or three months. And then the fruit ripens and it just sits there, doesn't grow. But it's not like our trees have already dropped all the leaves. This thing kind of drags on with its leaves. And then it doesn't really do anything until we put it out in the summertime. And then all of a sudden it sprouts back up and all these flowers come. Um, the only downside to it is you have to hand pollinate it. So mm -hmm. it has to be, um, have to get out there with your paintbrush. You do it about three o'clock in the afternoon. You, you, you see the flowers, they open up and there's pollen available. What, what color are the flowers? There's no like pollinators that will venture no, in? No, there's no pollinators. I mean, that's the problem with Cherimoya, even in the West. Oh, a specialist pollinator in that area. Yeah, huh? yeah it's like, yeah. it's in Mexico, but it's nowhere else. So they have to go out and do the hand pollination. Hmm. But that's pretty exciting. Um, we're, I'm working on that. And we're also doing... Uh, we continue, I continue to breed Birdman's here as the angel trumpets, <clears throat> trying to get them smaller so that we don't have these like 15 foot trees that grow up. So things that can actually be grown in containers um, in the home or um, outside in the summer. They're not going to take up all your space, but still have, you know, those amazing flowers on them. Great. I mean, I love that you're still keeping busy and it's and keeping it fresh and keeping it new for all of us. I mean, actually just coming from the herbarium and seeing like the plants that were available back in the Victorian era yeah. <laughs> and then, like exploring like all the new stuff that people are um, enjoying now. It's it's very cool to see. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Byron. Well, okay. I, I will let you get on with your day. OK, great. Awesome. Just all right. You. Bye. Uh -huh. say, say hi to Laurel Lynn for me.